Hi, my name's Nathan. I'm the senior pastor here at Bridgman, and we are so glad you could join us for our online service today. No matter where you are on the journey or what your story has been so far, we want you to feel welcome here at Bridgman and have the opportunity to discover the freedom, hope, and healing that is found in Jesus. If you'd like to reach out and connect with us, you can email hello at bridgman.org.au or if you have a prayer need, we'd love to pray for you and you can email prayer at bridgman.org.au. Our service will be starting in just a few moments time and we pray that you'll be blessed and strengthened as you join with us today. Well, that's awesome. What a privilege and honour that we can still worship our great God, even if we are scattered throughout our different homes. It's a real privilege and honour for me to introduce Dan Patterson. He's itinerant speaker. He works full-time for Ravi Zacharias Ministries. Uh, he's been, I've known Dan for quite a few years now. He's married with three young boys and it's such a privilege and honour to have him come and share with us tonight. Uh, so I know he can't hear you, but why don't you just give him a cheer, shout the TV down as he comes and share with us shares with us. Thanks so much, Dan. Morning, church. It's great to be with you, beaming into whether a living room or a bedroom. My name's Dan Patterson. I hope you have a cup of tea or a Bible ready to be able to engage with the message this morning. But I want to open with the kind of question that we'd normally get to ask face to face when we're together. And it's the question, how are you going? These seem to be incredibly strange times. I mean, in the beginning of this year alone for us here in Australia, we've gone from droughts to terrible, devastating fires to floods and now are experiencing a degree of lockdown from a global pandemic that's sweeping across the world. These are unsettling times in that they throw all of our normal rhythms into chaos. There are hundreds of thousands of people out of work. We are now heading towards 50,000 as the global death toll around the world. People are huddled in fear in their homes, isolating them from other people who used to be Warm sources of social encouragement now we're treating as almost opportunity for contagion. And it's just changing the way we think and feel about each other. And all of it is leaving people feeling tumultuous within. These are turbulent times. And it's into situations like these that we desperately need to turn to God's word to say, what is it that Jesus wants to speak to us? How is it that he wants us to make sense of these turbulent times. And so with that in mind this morning, I'd love for you to turn with me to 1 Peter. We're gonna be reading from the first chapter of this letter that was written from Peter to a bunch of believed Christians who were themselves facing dark, difficult and uncertain days. And I wanna, through this passage, actually process our desperate need for a theology of suffering in the Western world that helps us not just survive times like these, but grow and develop and become the kind of people that God wants us to be, that we can shine in times like these. Because the church, even though we're not gathering, the church is not shut down. The Word of God, even though Paul was in prison, is never chained. And this is the time that we as the church can speak most helpfully as people all around the world are asking this key question, what hope, what meaning, what sense can be made in our coronavirus age? So with that in mind, let's turn to 1 Peter 1 verses 3 to 9. And I'm going to pick up on four key phrases as we go through. Have that question in the back of your mind. What difference does the Christian story offer in a coronavirus age? Number one, the thing that it offers is this. We have hope, that in these turbulent times, we have an anchor for our souls. Now, remember Peter here, the author, he was on the boat when the sea raged around them. Remember Peter, whose soul felt the inner turmoil of denying his Lord three times. Remember Peter, who was huddled in fear in a locked room after Jesus' execution. And, and to Christians who are facing these dark times, here is how he opens his letter. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. There's the phrase, a living hope. We are careering towards Easter right now. Today, as you're gathered in your homes, marks Palm Sunday, the very time that Jesus announced himself as King, as Messiah, riding onto a donkey's colt into Jerusalem to come and set us free, to save us from evil, from sin, 
from death. And the people cried out, Hosanna, as they laid down their palms. Lord, save us, was the prayer. And next Sunday, we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, the moment where Jesus overthrows death as our great enemy, where he demotes death through his resurrection from the dead, where he proves his power to have the keys of life and death, such that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. If you don't believe in God, if you don't believe in Jesus, then it is right to fear death. Death is the great full stop in the sentence of reality. If God does not exist, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, but if Jesus did rise from the dead, the death is no longer a full stop in the sentence of reality. It's demoted to merely a comma, a pause, where death becomes a doorway through which we can enter into eternal life with God. That because Jesus rose again from the dead, so too do we have this promise that we can rise. Do you have this hope welling up in your heart right now? That one day Jesus will wipe away every tear from our eyes. That there will be no more suffering or crying or death or mourning or pain anymore for the old order of things will pass away as he comes to make all things new. Do you have this eternal Glory, hope that one day eternity will outweigh our present sufferings here and now. Because if you don't have that hope, it can be yours right now. If you simply respond to Jesus's invitation, if you cling to Christ, when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, will live. But he who believes in me will never really die. Do you believe this? Peter, Jesus, they want us to recognize in dark times, we have hope that can stand all of what we're facing and will one day bring it to an end. Number two in this passage, we have lament. One of the most natural things for us to do in the midst of a crisis is begin to ask the hard questions, the heart questions. God, why would you permit something like COVID-19 to wreak havoc all around the world, to bring the world to its knees? So much death, so much fear, so much economic hardship. Those most at risk, the elderly, the poor, the sick. God, where are you in the midst of this? One of the most comforting things for us as we begin to ask these heart questions is that the Bible is not silent on the reality of our suffering. Yes, it says there is this hope for the future, but it also speaks about our present reality. Verse six in 1 Peter 1, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of of trials. Our second key phrase, suffer grief. We suffer grief right now. You know, unfortunately, like Job's friends, there are some Christians all around the world who are trying to tell us exactly why the coronavirus is broken out in the way that it has. They're saying that this is an act of God's judgment, that this is God's warning as to what's coming. They're giving an answer as to why this virus. But the truth is, we have no answers as Christians as to why God allows this particular virus. Jesus warns his disciples away from making these sorts of karmic style reasonings where we're getting what we deserve. In John chapter 9, when the disciples come across a man who was born blind, they ask Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, actually, it's neither. It's not like that. It's more complex, as we'll see in just a moment. And because it's not that simple, often we are left with huge amounts of uncertainty. We're left with mystery. And that can open up for us all kinds of emotions, all kinds of questions and uncomfortable feelings. And you know what? That's actually okay. Nowhere in scripture does God command that we be stoic and deny the deep welling up of emotion within as we face these tumultuous times. And what the Bible does offer us though is actually a rich genre, a genre called 
lament, where some of the greatest heroes in the Bible ask very raw questions from deep places of disappointment with God and a sense of questioning, where is he in the midst of my trial? Uh, Think King David, a man who is well acquainted with grief and suffering, having lost some of his children either to sedition or to sickness. And in Psalm 10, 1, he opens up with this question. Why, O oh God, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Think of the entire book of Lamentations, where God's people are wrestling with where is God in the aftermath of their exile from Jerusalem. Or you've got the psalm that Jesus himself quotes on Good Friday in the Easter story. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God. My God, why have you forsaken me? This great cry of dereliction. You see, the Bible actually gives us permission. It gives us a register to give full voice to our protest, the evil and the suffering that's in our world. And and just this week, a Bible scholar, N.T. Wright, in Time magazine, wrote a brilliant article saying this is actually part of our Christian vocation. In the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of mystery as to why this virus now, the Christian response, like Jesus, who wept over the death of his friend, who entered into grief right now part of our christian calling is actually in the uncertainty and the lack of answers is to enter into grief is to cry out with the full weight of emotions that you might be feeling is not to feel like you have to hold back from god he's big enough to handle whatever your heart needs to throw at him to grieve with the Holy Spirit, deep groanings for the pain and the suffering that's going on, whether in your life or those of your neighbours or those who are facing the suffering all around the world. We have this opportunity to lament. And I wonder right now, do your own prayers give voice to the depth of your feeling? Please be honest with God with where you are. Enter into the season of lament as we suffer these griefs. A third from this passage, we actually do have some answers. You see, 1 Peter 1 is followed by 1 Peter 3, 15, where the Apostle Peter will go on to say, always be prepared to give an answer, an apologetic, to make a defense, to give your reasons for this hope that is within us, but to do this with gentleness and respect. And even though right now, We don't have a sense as to why this particular virus, that doesn't mean we don't have some answers in the Christian story as to why God may allow or permit suffering and viruses in the big picture that help us make sense something as to what's going on right now. Follow with me in 1 Peter 1 verse 7 where the Apostle Peter says, These have come so that the tested genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold may be proven to be genuine at the revealing was Jesus Christ is revealed. These have come is our third phrase. The Apostle Peter is trying to give to those struggling Christians, trying to make sense of their turbulent times, something of an explanation. Why is God permitting this struggle to come to us? These have come. And he goes on to give some kind of explanation. Now, when it comes to something like coronavirus, this would fit into what philosophers would call the category of natural evils. There are moral evils where suffering comes to us at the hands of other moral agents, whether human or otherwise, because of what people's choices do. That can lead to our suffering. Like if I were to punch you in the nose, you would suffer. But then there are also natural evils or where suffering comes to us at the mercy of nature. Think sicknesses or tornadoes or other natural disasters or viruses as we're experiencing right now. Now, that phrase in and of itself, natural evil, is almost a contradiction in terms. You see, as Christians, Christianity is one story of making sense of reality, one story amongst many that swirl around in our world. And many people who want to say, if God, why the coronavirus? Or like Peter Fitzsimmons did, that this is going to be the great end of religion, this current pandemic, because no one can believe in God after a situation like this, sort of raising these ancient arguments afresh. What the alternative to the Christian story is, the secular story would essentially say, 
that this is the way that the world is meant to be. You see, if all there is is nature, then there is no such thing as natural evil. Evil is a moral category. And on the natural or purely the metaphysical naturalism story, there is no sense of ultimate right and wrong, of good and evil. Morality is just an evolutionary illusion that's foisted upon us by our development and our genetics. Now, what this essentially means is that the secular story has nothing to say to that deep intuition that we all have in the face of the kind of suffering that we're seeing, that this is wrong, that this is not the way that the world is meant to be, because what's natural cannot ultimately be evil unless something has gone wrong with nature itself. And the secular story can't make sense of that, whereas the Christian story actually can. You see, if we trace back in the Christian story to the first scene of of the Bible in the book of Genesis, where God creates us for good, we're told that God wants to create a cosmic theater of meaning, that he creates human beings made in his image so that we're capable of deep and meaningful relationships and a role to bear God's image, meaning to be able to do what God does, to continue to bring order out of chaos, to make this world fruitful by building cultures and ultimately by framing beauty. But if God is going to make human beings with meaningful lives, with the ability to love, that means this also needs to be a world with a significant degree of freedom, where our choices matter, where our choices have consequences, such that any world of meaning is also a world of consequences. You see, God designed there to be natural laws that govern the movements of matter and energy, but he also wove into the universe a moral fabric, a moral grain, such that human beings, we can either trust the moral boundaries that God gave to us, that that is right and wrong, good and evil, or we can seize that defining power for ourselves and instead try and define good and evil on our own terms. This choice was represented in the Garden of Eden as a fruit tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, tragically, rather than trust God, human beings instead rebelled against God, turned our back on God's goodness, and instead, in seizing power for ourselves, we became gripped by evil. And where God had set us up to be gardeners and governors of God's good world, by walking off the job, It wasn't God who left and was responsible for the brokenness of our universe. It was we who walked off the job. And as a result, the entire system now has come under a curse. It is broken. It's not operating to us the way that it naturally should. Now, I find this interesting when we consider what place do viruses have in creation in general? And were you to ask someone who works in virology, you would discover that viruses are actually incredibly important to be able to keep a kind of ecological balance in check. If it weren't for good viruses, we would have single-celled bacteria consuming all of the available resources on Earth such that higher life forms like us would never even have the opportunity to exist. We would be crowded out. We depend upon the success of good viruses to keep these bacteria in check at the right balance for our ecosystem. And so we're actually dependent upon them in so many ways. It's only when we interact with viruses in a way that wasn't intended for us, when we're at odds with the natural world, as the Genesis story now describes, that we actually suffer the devastating effects of what we're seeing. Similarly, tornadoes, there is nothing innately terrible about a tornado or floods or fires. They serve purposes in the broader ecological system, but it's yet when we get in their way, when we're not interacting with nature in the way that we're intended to, to rule over and to tame a wild world beyond the borders of Eden, that is when we experience suffering at the hands of nature. It wasn't until we'd sinned and gone against God's moral design that we became subject to death and decay as this universe itself now affected, is affected by the curse and longs for the day where Jesus will come to set everything right. And so the Christian story goes a long way to explaining why we see brokenness in the world, disease, death, and sickness. It's not as a judgment on that particular person because they did something particularly evil. It's sadly now just part of our world system. 
But what does that mean for us when we do come to these experiences of suffering, of grief, of sickness, of death? What is God saying to us in the midst of that? What is it that Jesus might be wanting to say to us as Christians right now here in our coronavirus age? And here we actually turn to discover the last part of our passage in 1 Peter. Number four, that we have hope. We have number two, sorry, uh, we have lament. Number three, we have some answers. And number four, we actually have work to do. Read on with me here, verses six to nine, we'll go back. Even though now you have had to suffer grief as various trials have come upon us, these have come so that the testing of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You see, suffering is not a wasted opportunity in the economy of God. In Romans 8, 28, we're told that for those who love God and are called according to his purposes, he works together all things for the good of those who love him. He actually can turn around something that was meant for evil or something that has a negative result seemingly to us and bend it somehow for good if we lean into him in the right way. And Peter here actually offers a metaphor of refinement. It's like going to a forge and melting down the gold, a precious metal. And in that process, the pure gold is separated from the impurities, which then are required to be scooped off so that when the source of heat, the suffering itself, is ultimately taken away, that that gold hardens in a more pure state. You know, it actually feels like there's less of it. <laughs> it actually feels like something's been taken away from you, but you're more pure having gone through it, having borne those scars. You may feel smaller, but you've actually been made more like you were ultimately meant to be. If you cooperate with God, if you do the work that he wants us to do in this time. You see, if you're new to the Christian story, Christianity, this Easter is not about simply you getting spiritual fire insurance to get a ticket to heaven when you die. It's not about getting out of hell and into heaven. It's about God getting the hellishness out of us here and now so that we become heavenly Beings that we become more like the kind of people we were always meant to be, people who look like Jesus. Part of salvation is not just getting saved in the past, a moment where we got saved by believing in Jesus. It's an ongoing process of being saved from patterns of thinking and behaviours and ways of acting in the world. Feelings that we have that just don't reflect the love and the heart and the beauty and the goodness of God. God wants to melt these off us and he uses suffering to do it. I wonder as you've been locked down in your home, what has God by his spirit been putting his finger on in your life? Something that needs to change. Perhaps you've been so caught up in the busyness of this world that you've been neglecting the kind of rhythms of hearing from God, responding to God, of loving God and loving others that you know you're meant to be given to, but have just let be crowded out by the busyness, the cares of this day. And maybe there has been a particular direction, a sin in your life that You've just been allowing free reign, but all of a sudden with this interruption, you're being kept from it and God's putting his finger and saying, this is a mercy, a moment where I want to deal with this thing in your life to bring it up so that it ultimately can be changed. What is God putting his finger on that's been a barrier to you being able to share his story or to do his work in the world? And this could be in our silent, forced Sabbath, just a moment to reflect and to say, God, what do you want afresh for my life? And how do I rebuild in this time with my family, with my friends, with my neighbours, the kind of spiritual rhythms of community, of repentance, of confession, of prayer, of opening up the scriptures, of giving to you and your work that I actually need to hear afresh and realign, repent and reorder my world so that I'm making sure 
that in the end vision of things, I've become the person that you want me to be. I love the Marvel Universe, and one of my favorite parts in all of the great movie epics is in the movie Infinity Wars. It's part of the final two big wrap-up of the MC Universe. Now, if you're not, uh, haven't seen Infinity Wars, Total spoiler alert, I'm about to wreck it for you. But there's this scene where Doctor Strange, Benedict Cumberpatch, uh, has the ability to look into all of the possible futures to figure out what's our best course of action to defeat the main bad guy, Thanos. And he goes and explores 14 million different futures and comes back out of this trance and is having a conversation with Iron Man. And Iron Man says, you know, you've seen these 14 million futures. In how many of them do we win? Only one. And because Doctor Strange knew the end game, knew which of those futures would actually result in the right end, he does something that in the present actually looks really strange. He gives up the very thing that they were meant to protect, the time stone. And everyone looks at him and thinks, what are you doing? You've just thrown in the towel. You're doing the thing that you shouldn't do in this present circumstance. But he knows how things are meant to play out. And so he lives towards that future. It was the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard who said, that all of life is meant to be understood backwards in order to be lived forwards. And here Peter's saying, if you know the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul, to look like Jesus, then right now you can actually treat suffering as a step in that direction and experience it as inexpressible joy because you know that if you lean into God and use this time wisely, intentionally to hear from him and realign your life, that this is actually drawing you to become the right kind of person, the person that he wants you to be. Let me just leave you with three questions for discussion at home after church this morning. Number one, why is the gospel good news to those around you right now? In view of the death and the fear, what hope does the resurrection of Jesus offer for eternal life and for peace with God now? Number two, if God, why the coronavirus? When conversations come up like this, What can you say to give some kind of helpful answer to those who are asking? And number three, what is Jesus saying right now to you about who you're becoming and how you can realign your life to his purposes? Let me pray. God, our Father, you love us more than we could ever imagine. And in the midst of our suffering, our fear, our anxiety, you come to be with us, Emmanuel. And Jesus grieved with us, he wept with us, he walked with us, and he suffered for us on the cross. That we believe in a God with scars, a God who knows our pain and can be a good shepherd to walk us through it. And I pray for whatever people are feeling right now, that you would draw them to believe in Jesus and to have that hope. That you would lead them into lament. That you would help them formulate a response that serves their own mind to love you with their mind and to love others by giving an answer for the hope that's within them. And I pray too that you would help us consider by your spirit, what are you saying to us right now? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, well, thanks so much, Dan. Uh, What an amazing message that we've heard from him. If his message impacted you in some way or another, I wanna just encourage you to uh, respond to God. You can do that even in this very moment. And so I just wanna lead you in a simple prayer to say, God, it could be, God, I'd like to find out more about you. I wanna know more about you. It could be, hey, I've been away from God. I wanna uh, reconnect with him. And so I'm just gonna lead you in a simple prayer that you can pray even right now. Father, I wanna reconnect to you. I wanna know you, maybe for the first time. Father, come into my life, I pray. Thank you for dying for my sins, rising again, overcoming death. Come and fill me with your Holy Spirit now. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Well, let's worship our great God now, wherever you are, let's give Him thanks and praise. Thanks for joining with us for our service today. If you sense God speaking to you or you'd like to find out more, we want to help and encourage you on your journey of faith. You can reach out to us via our website or email hello at bridgman.org.au. And don't forget, if you have a prayer need, we'd love to pray for you. And you can fill in a prayer card on our website or email prayer at bridgman.org.au. I'm praying God's blessing for you this week and we look forward to connecting with you again soon.